You're listening to the Maritime Gardening Podcast, episode 139, brought to you by Vessi's Seeds. Well, folks, today we have author, teacher, master gardener, dedicated Mythbuster, and regular guest of the show, Robert Pavlis, here to talk about composting, and that's fresh off his new book, Compost Science for Gardeners. Robert, say hello, and tell us how the growing season was in Ontario this year. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, it, it was kind of crappy, actually. <laughs> <laughs> that's I kind of that's a lot has been going around. We, yeah, yes. we we had a really cool summer. It's uh, that's amazing. So we a lot of rain, a lot of rain in the yeah. spring. A uh, really cool summer, and now we've got a really hot fall. So our weather's really turned upside down this year. But yeah, most things did all right. We had a similar difficulty. We had a lot of excessive rain. I just did a video on it this week or last week about, you know, excessive rain kind of flushing out all the nitrogen in the soil. And a lot of people had a lot of weeds and, and poor results. Um, I had some beds. I have a few beds that didn't do that well. But generally speaking, we, I mean, we had a lot of heat mm -hmm. um, and we had no shortage of water. Um, mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, it was a good year all around. I got... I got as much of everything as I wanted, and I was as busy as I wanted to be in the garden, mm. uh, so I can't complain. Um, well, today what we're going to do with Robert is he's written this new book, Compost Science for Gardeners. I highly recommend it as a something to pick up to read or to buy as a Christmas present for uh, someone you care about. And what we're going to do is, instead of the usual thing when Robert's written a book, and he seems to write one every single year, um, is where I, I've gone through the book meticulously and I have all kinds of nerdy questions of my own. Uh, instead, what we're going to do is have Robert just tell us the top five things he thinks people need to know about composting and the top five things people tend to get wrong about composting. And another twist I'm going to do with the episode today, which is a very different thing for me, I'm just going to try this for an episode, is I'm not going to edit anything out of this. I mean, unless something really bad happens, like one of us goes into a <laughs> sneezing fit or something like that. But sometimes I edit the edit, uh, episode if something weird happens, or if I usually I say something stupid and I'll just take that whole section out so I don't look stupid. But I'm gonna try just just letting it go, and uh, we'll see see how it all works out. I've never done this before. I mean, maybe I'm hoping it trains me to be a bit more under control. Um, but we'll, we'll see how it all goes. Mm. Um, so ha that having been said, and I guess we should ask you: Do you have any more books? on the works well there's another one that's already out but since you're behind in your what? reading <laughs> <laughs> i do my homework so microbe uh, science for gardeners uh, came out in september started wow. shipping in september oh it just came out and i'm putting the finishing touches on food science for gardeners which will be ah, sounds interesting written for christmas and will be out next fall or late summer you're so, a machine man you are a machine um yeah well we have a whole series of, of books now about uh science for gardeners in the uh, time you've written half a dozen books i've i've about half completed one book <laughs> <laughs> i don't think it'll be uh as good yeah um, but your, your thousand page book is bigger than mine <laughs> <laughs> exactly we'll see how that goes <laughs> okay so microbe science for gardeners and then food science for gardeners that's uh, that sounds really great I, I really look forward to reading that just that's, that's the food thing yeah. is a topic i get into from time to time um on my Substack page because it's one of those things where people will say uh oh you're cooking your kale it has no nutrition at all Mm -hmm. yeah, of course it does it, it you're losing some things but there's a lot of things you think you're losing you're not losing when you cook a food um yeah. you are losing some things but even the things you're losing you're not losing all of them um yeah. so it's uh yeah it's an interesting it's one of those areas that there's a lot of people talking and a lot of opinions and very little people looking at the measured numbers yeah. <laughs> you know like from yeah. the usda and that sort of thing um, it's a completely different story when you like you th you think listening to people that if you cook kale it has no vitamin C at all, just yeah. just gone. Whereas it's I don't know what it is like you 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 know you lose seventy percent of it or so whatever the number is, but you still have some, you know. Well, you actually have have most of it, and in fact, some nutrients actually increase with cooking. Yes, like yeah, like a bean. Don't... 
Yeah. They don't all go down. So, you know, things like vitamin C are very heat sensitive. So you lose vitamin C, but most of the diet in North America has enough vitamin C anyway. So it's not an issue. Right? Yes, um, that's right. It's not become so, more available, yeah. easier for your body to digest. That's another issue that's yes. really important that people forget about. Yeah. Yeah. Fire is an amazing thing. Yeah. yeah, so the book's going to be not so much on growing as, uh, you know, what is nutrient-dense food? How do you grow nutritious food? How do you cook it, preserve it? What happens during all those processes? So okay. it'll, be, it'll be kind of an interesting book. And and there really is no book for gardeners like that out there. There are, no. there are textbooks out there, but not much for gardeners. So That sounds really... Well, uh, that sounds like a really, I mean, the, part of the reason I do cooking videos on my YouTube channel is because not a lot of the gardening channels show you what to do with it, yeah. right? And uh, I think last year I had this uh, lady from, I can't remember her name now, but uh, she was a home economics teacher and we had her on to talk about canning. There's mm -hmm. a lady that, uh, that teaches at one of these uh, agricultural extensions in the United States and all she talks about is preserving food. And uh, we were talking a lot about this sort of thing because people will think like canned food is not nutritious because it's been cooked to smithereens. And, you know, she, she was, uh, she was like, I don't know, my 80 or in her late seventies, really feisty and just full of, uh, <laughs> she was great. <laughs> so that's a good thing you're doing that book. Cause I think that's mm -hmm. much needed, you know, yeah. and mm -hmm. hopefully it, it stays in the, in the tradition of your, uh, myth busting. Oh, Absolutely. Yes. I can't, I can't write without yeah. throwing some myths in there. Exactly. Can't help it. Great. Okay. So top five things people should know about composting. What do you got yes. for us, Robert? So I put this list together and uh, things people should know. The first one is that microbes are on everything. So people talk about building these compost piles and then going out and buying some microbes to throw in their compost or getting some soil and throwing that in because we, we have to add these microbes. Uh, well, one of the things that we don't realize is that everything has a fairly thick layer, layer of microbes on them, right? Uh, both when the plants are growing and when they're dried and when they're dead and, and so on. So when we throw this stuff together, it, it's just full of microbes, all kinds of them. So we don't have to add those. We, we don't have to worry about that. Right. Uh, the microbes will, are already there and, and they'll do their job. Um, the interesting thing is that there's lots of different microbes and they like different temperatures and different pHs and different drynesses and so on. And as that compost pile proceeds, the populations change, you know, right. it, it, the compost heats up and some go into hibernation and others start growing and then it gets a little hotter and then there's a new group coming along and then it cools down and there's a new group coming along. And so as these changes take place, the populations are continually changing too, which uh, is kind of fascinating. And we actually don't know that much about it. But as, anyways, composting happens because of the microbes. Yes. And there's tons of them in there. So don't worry about it. This okay. is um. You 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 were on my podcast before, and there's I made a little clip from one of the conversations we had, mm -hmm. where you were saying, speaking to a question a lot of I think a lot of people say where they buy mycorrhiza or they'll go in a forest and dig up some magic soil and put it in their compost to get you know to inoculate or whatever mm -hmm. to get things going, and. You know, I can't remember what the title I made of the video was, but like the title was something like, you don't need to do that. <laughs> <laughs> no. And and you're being very adamant saying like, this stuff's everywhere. What are you talking about? Right. Anyway, that video, almost every week I get an angry comment saying, you need <laughs> to do this, right? Like this people are very, people are just so attached to this notion that the, you know, that there isn't this stuff, the stuff just isn't everywhere. Uh, you know, for some reason, they, they want to hang on to the notion that it's a, an exotic thing that has to be brought in and introduced. Yeah. Well, I, th I think the reason is that we don't see them, right? Yes. We, we, we see the leaf, we see the stem, we don't see any microbes on there. Uh, even if there's a rotting spot, we don't see the microbes. We might know, well, the rot is caused by microbes, but we can't see them. So psychologically, we assume they're not there. Um, 
But as it turns out, we're we're just very our eyes are useless for looking at microbes and, and they're just covered. I mean, billions and billions on every tiny little speck of stuff in your compost pile. Right. So forget the microbes. They're already there. It's like I remember seeing when I was in school as a kid and they'd show you like a little a microscope of your skin mm-hmm. and all these dis- or your eyelashes, you know, all these disgusting things that are crawling all over your mm-hmm. body. And it was yeah. just terrifying, <laughs> you know, so yeah. Yeah, it's the same thing. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So number two, I think that some people have the wrong impression about composting uh, when it comes to selecting the type and how we do it and so on. And um, there's a wide range of composting, everything from extremely easy to more difficult and many things in between. And so the person should not shy away from composting because they don't want more work or they don't want something complicated and so on. You have a choice as to how much effort you want to put into this. In fact, the easiest composting method in the book is is my cut and drop method, which is actually easier than doing nothing, right? I basically go through the garden and, and if I have a branch that needs cutting, I cut it and drop it. If a flower is finished, I cut it and drop it. And I let the stuff just compost in my garden. You're like mulching I'm, and composting. I'm mulching and composting and fertilizing all at the same time because I'm too lazy to do anything except cut the dead flower off. Yes. Right? And, you know, that is composting. That is a very productive way of composting. Now, it's slow. I, I can compost a different way and it's faster. But I'm not in any hurry. Okay, I'm quite fine with slow. I just don't need the extra aggravation and and worry. And you don't have to know anything except how to drop it, yes. <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, so I think that people, if people are shying away from composting because they're they're worried about learning stuff and then it's complicated and it costs money or you don't have the space for it and all these other excuses, forget all those. There is a way to compost. And one of the things the book does is it goes through all these various methods and yes. the comparison and says, okay, this is the pro of this one, and this is a negative and so on. And I think it's important that each person pick the method that suits them best. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, for instance, the book also has a chapter on vermicomposting, which is yes. using worms to compost, which I, I think is, is a great idea, but quite honestly, I don't like worms. And, right. you know, I don't need worms in my basement no. and I don't need the extra work. So it's not something that appeals to me, but it's a, it's a good way of composting. It's one of those options and it does have some pros, right? I've tried um, it, you know, in the, I've tried it, uh, there was one winter where I did it in the garage, but it's very science experiment like, mm-hmm. um, and it, and it also will not keep up with your kitchen output. Like there's like, if you've only got one. You didn't have enough worms. <laughs> but like, if you've got one in one container like this, I mean, you know, we, we, we'll, we fill a salad bowl almost every day. Cause we mm. do a lot of, we have a family of four and we have a lot of fresh cooked foods or a lot of vegetables and stuff like that. We create a lot of compost. I say two liters of compost a day. Right. So, you know, if a five or 10, let's say a 10 gallon, composting station will not keep up with with that um right. it'll get filled up and so you'd need i would need multiple yeah, yeah. you know anyway it was yeah. it, you know it would it works but it's very science experimenty and very mm-hmm. you know and you know you're waiting for it didn't smell bad the garage didn't smell bad it works it does work mm-hmm. um yeah. But, yeah, one uh, one of the things I always tell people is, is vermi composting is is as much about the pets, the worms, that is, yes. as it is about composting, right? Yes, yeah. Um, no, but that's perfect for some people. So yeah. whoever you are, whatever your condition, you can do composting. You just have to uh, figure out which one matches what you want. Right? Yes. I just had a guy at work, and uh, they just getting in the garden. He came and asked me. He wants to get into compost, but he wasn't. Sh- he he was thinking of taking a course on how to compost and i was like you know you can just i'm reading a book right now i'll lend it to you what i've done <laughs> um but really you could just throw stuff in a pile um just don't put any just just put vegetables in there don't put any meat and stuff 
He says, "Why well, meat won't compost itself? Well, meat will compost. It's it's great compost, but it might attract rats and stuff right. like that. You put it in a pile, and you know it'll. That's all you need to do if you you know if you want it. If you got lots of time, it can be very really lazy <laughs> with compost, you know. Mm -hmm. And he was kind of like, uh, it's almost like he'd talk to someone and they'd convinced him that he needed a lot of knowledge." Um, and I mean, if you're trying to do hot composting, there's a bit of a knack to that, yeah. I suppose. But for cold composting, it's just a pile yeah. of stuff. You know? Well, I, you know, the more people learn, the the faster they'll be able to make their yes. compost and the more efficient the composting method becomes. Right. Yes. And so people can choose how interested they want to be. Yes, um, exactly. Which is really nice, right? Um, so, uh, another thing that people don't realize, uh, most people, anyways, is is that composting actually produces CO two. So pretty much everybody now knows we don't want to produce CO two, right? <laughs> That's why we have global warming because there's too much carbon in the air. We produce too much CO two. Well, composting produces CO two. So some people are now saying, well, you shouldn't compost because you're producing all this CO2. It's not good for the environment. And the truth is composting produces CO2. What you have to do is compare that to the alternatives, right? So the one alternative is you send it to the city dump. Where it comes. And, and, and when your, you know, your old vegetable scraps and so on go to the city dump, they get buried and there isn't enough oxygen in there. So they don't actually compost, but they do get chemically converted and they produce nitrous oxide. Nitrous oxide is, if I remember correctly, something like 20 times worse than CO2 for global as, warming. As a greenhouse gas. Yeah. I see. So taking it to the dump is a lot worse than composting, right? No matter what you do with this kitchen scraps, they're going to degrade. They're going to compost, right? And they're going to produce some CO2. That's just the way how nature works. When the tree in the woods falls down dead, that log rots and produces CO2. Um, we can't get away from that. So it's it comes down to a question of, well, what is worse for the environment? The single best thing you can do with your kitchen scraps, if you're only worried about the environment, is to keep them on your property and let them compost, rot, dry up, whatever, but leave them on your property. Oh, because mm -hmm. you lower the carbon footprint associated the, with, yes. The minute you, I mean, putting them into a green bin, letting the city take it, you know, is also an option, but then you got some truck running around the city, right? taking it to some facility that's using all kinds of energy to compost, and then they truck that stuff to some other place. Yes. So the single best thing you can do for the environment with your kitchen scraps is to get them in the, excuse me, to get them in the garden and compost them. Yeah, it makes it sense. It does produce CO2, but it's the best option we have. It's kind of like a net, net, net effect. Yeah, net harm. It's the least, it's, it's the lowest amount of harm you could possibly do. Uh, right. You can't have zero CO2. This is minimal CO2, the most, right. you know, an optimal minimal CO2 sort of thing. Yeah. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. And as humans, we have to eat and eating produces CO2 and having That's scraps right. produces CO2. So we have to minimize the CO2. We, we can't eliminate it. Yeah. So the idea that composting is not good for global warming is, is really wrong. It's actually the best option for this, this I material. See. That's a good point. Yeah. Um, the other thing I think that's important to understand about compost is, is what does it do for us? Okay, so now we have this big pile of compost. And people get very excited about this, or, or at least gardeners do. <laughs> they, they love this compost. But why do they love it? And I'm not sure people actually know why it, it's that good. So we think of it kind of like a fertilizer, right? We put it in our garden and all these nutrients get released. Um, and that's partially true. But the real benefit to our soil and to plants is that it feeds microbes. 
Okay. Yes. The single biggest value of compost is that it's microbe food. And it's the microbes in soil that make better soil, improve the quality of soil, feed the plants, make plants grow better, and so on. All those things happen because of the microbes in our soil. So as, as a gardener, if I had to pick one thing to advise a gardener and says, this is what you must do in life. If you want a good garden, you have to feed the microbes. Right. The more you feed them, the more you'll have, the more microbes you have, the better soil you'll have, the better plants you'll have, and so on and so on. Everything kind of falls from the fact that you have those microbes and you're taking care of them. And compost is the single best way to feed microbes. Right. Feed the thing that makes the soil better. Feed the thing that's gardening all around the clock. Yeah. You know, yeah. That makes sense. Um, what was the next one? Can be done. Oh, I, I think the other thing is uh, that composting can be done indoors. So people yes. who don't garden or don't have space to garden or have very, very tiny gardens, you can compost indoors, and there are several options that uh, we discuss in the book. One is the vermicompost we, we just discussed. That's very popular with a lot of people. And I mentioned the fact that it doesn't really appeal to me, but there are a lot of people out there that love vermicomposting. Mm -hmm. uh, the other technique is called pokashi, which is a fermentation process that you can do basically in a pail that's sitting in your kitchen or under your kitchen sink somewhere. Um, very easy to do, uh, really doesn't have any smell, very little equipment. Um, it will uh, compost that material. Now, when you're done, you still have to do something with that vermi, uh, that uh, bokashi material, um, but you can put it out in your garden or give it to a friend who gardens and, and so on. Uh, another method that's not very popular in North America for some reason, but is in Asia, is called uh, ecoenzyme. And um, so you, you take, uh, they usually take fruits, but fruits and vegetables, uh, they add some uh, molasses or sugar, put it in some water, seal it in a container, and it ferments. And it makes a kind of uh, fermented juice that you could probably drink, although there's a fair amount of vinegar in there. And then they use that for as a cleaning product. And then the remaining organic material is partially composted and that can be thrown in your garden and you can use it to, you know, to improve your soil. Oh. So those are all things that you can do indoors. Right. So it's not just composting for outdoors. Right. Yeah. All right. So those are the five those, things every gardener should know. Those are five things that I think gardeners maybe don't know and should know. Okay. All right. All right. <laughs> Uh, there are others, but I just happened to pick those those okay. five. Um, so then we we're going to go through a list of well, what what do they get wrong about composting? Yes, um, and there's a long list here. Yes, um, we don't have I to limit it to five. You can keep, <laughs> you can keep going. But well, number one has sort of three parts, so it's an A B C section. <laughs> okay, I I think the biggest misconception about composting is this idea of browns and greens right so the idea is that when you make compost you have to get the right ratio of material so that it actually processes that things actually decompose and to make that simple people have come up with this idea well you need browns and you need greens and you mix those browns and greens in a certain ratio and that makes the perfect ratio for making fast compost right and i believe that for years and uh, just so our viewers fat fast compost what do you mean when you say fast comp? Just so people uh, know exactly what you mean. Depends a bit on your your climate, but let's say you're summertime, so it's fairly hot. You're probably looking somewhere between one and two months. Right, one to two months for the compost to be ready to be. It, it's it's not it's broken down enough to put it. It's just just the black stuff that looks like soil, but it isn't. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, we're, we're going to talk about that one too. Okay. Okay. Great. But yeah, so it's yeah. it's what we call finished. So it, finished. it looks yeah. like soil. Yeah. Right? Okay. Yeah. 
um, it's very dependent on, you know, what you put into it. it. It's dependent on your temperature very much, you know, in cold climates, nothing happens in winter. <laughs> um, uh, it depends on the moisture levels and, and so on. But if, if you're making good, fast compost in a warm climate, yeah, it's about 60 days. Oh. Um, right. Okay, so we, we have this brown and green ratio. Yes. And the ratio that you're heading for is a 30 to 1 ratio of browns to greens. Okay. Well, here's news for you. Um, the whole idea of browns and greens is completely wrong <laughs> and doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Right. Okay. What the benefit of it is that it's a simple way to explain to people uh, that they need to mix different things. And so the browns and greens comes from the fact that, well, in fall, we have a lot of brown leaves and they don't have a lot of nitrogen. They're mostly carbon. And most brown things are mostly carbon. So old stems, you know, straw, a bale of straw. Most things that are brown are carbon with very little nitrogen. The green stuff is like your lettuce leaves, you know, stem of celery, whatever. It's green. Grass clippings, they're green. They have more nitrogen than carbon. Oh, sorry, that's not quite correct. They have a high level of nitrogen relative to carbon. Yes. Right. The important thing is we need to get the carbon and nitrogen ratios in the right ratio so that we get processing taking place. Uh, why is that? Well, remember, it's the microbes that are doing all this for us. And microbes, well, they like a certain diet and they like a 30 to 1 ratio of carbon to nitrogen. If we give them lots of carbon, they can't eat the stuff because there isn't enough nitrogen to help them digest the carbon. Right. If we give them too much nitrogen, then there's other chemical reactions that take place that makes the pile toxic to them and kills them. Right. So we have to get this ratio right because that's what their diet is. Right, right. That's why we're doing this. We have to feed the microbes in that pile the kind of food they like. And so that's that ratio. That makes sense. Well, the first thing is that this 30 to 1 ratio that people talk about has nothing to do with browns and greens. It actually has to do with carbon and nitrogen, not browns and greens. And that's really quite different. Uh, for instance, uh, you might have some brown coffee grounds. And you say, oh, well, that, that's a pail full of brown stuff. Well, no, actually, coffee grounds are an actual, it's a green. It's nice. Because they have a lot of nitrogen in it. Yes. Same with manure, which is brown, brown. but it's actually a green. Yes. Right. yes. Uh, you have leaves. Well, you know, one week the leaves on the tree are green, and the next week they're brown. Like, you know, are they browns or are they greens? Right. So the brown, that's one reason the browns and greens are no good. But the other reason is that it's, it isn't a ratio of browns and greens. It's a ratio of carbon to nitrogen. Yes. Right. The second reason it doesn't work is is that when we talk about a thirty to one ratio, we're talking about the weight of material, not the volume of material. Oh, I see. Okay? Whereas gardeners like to work in volumes: a shovel full, you know, a shovel full of green to yeah. thirty shovelfuls of brown, yes. a wheelbarrow of green to a wheelbarrow of brown, or thirty wheelbarrows of brown, and so on. Right. Well, that's not how you calculate these things. These are based on weights, not on volume. And you can imagine in the fall, you've got all these, these leaves, right? They're fluffy and they're all, they make a big pile, but weight-wise, there's very little there. Oh, like leaves to grass clippings. Grass clippings are dense. And heavy. Grass clippings are denser, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, wood trimmings are very dense compared to leaves. I've always noticed if you gather leaves by just running the lawnmower with the bag, yeah, they heat up because because yeah. you're getting grass up and you know like there's yep. some grass coming in with them right yeah you know like when you're I mean I, I usually get leaves from people they just leave them out I'll gather them in my car on the way to work in the morning and then mm. you come back to the car and sometimes the car is all <laughs> steam, <laughs> steamed up on the inside you know it's all fogged if this happened yeah. to me a week ago I had uh, three bags that had leaves but it was just leaves on the top. The bags were about three quarters full of grass. 
Mm-hmm. And when I came out to my car, the entire car, it looked like someone had taken a shower inside the car. It was the, all the windows were soaked. And it was from all the condensation from the heat inside those bags of grass. <laughs> I mean, giant leaf bags, right? Full of grass, chock yeah. full. Of, and it was probably mowed at night when it was dewy. Um, mm-hmm. So it was pretty, pretty nasty. And I have hay fever. That was a rough drive home. <laughs> I, <was, laughs> I was wrecked. <laughs> Well, you see, one of the things you demonstrated, though, is that composting is really easy. It just happens. Yes, it was happening. <laughs> you know, even if you don't mix it the right way, it just it happens on its own. So it is easy. Yeah. Yes. Um, the, the third thing that's critical here is that when we talk about a ratio of 30 to 1, we're, we're talking weight, but we're also talking dry weight. Oh. Right? Uh-huh. So you just said your grass clippings... We're, we're wet, right? Well, you got to dry them out and then weigh them. Then they don't weigh anything. It's <laughs> well, all water, you know? Yeah, yeah. Like these ratios, they come from lab research and labs yes. always report their data as, you know, weight per unit dry weight. Lab okay. condition. Always dry because the water makes such a big impact, right? Again, if we go back to leaves and, and grass, they're actually a good example. The leaves are quite dry. The grass clippings are wet. Well, you have to account for the moisture differences. Right? Yes. Whereas uh, the other thing that happens is you go out one day and the leaves are nice and fluffy and they're all dry and then it rains and the next day you go to make your compost, they're all wet, right? So you can't weigh the wet leaves and the dry, the dry leaves and, and assume they're the same amount. So to do this properly, you have to use dry weight, which nobody knows. We don't have the numbers for that. We're not going to go and dry this stuff. We have to use weight, which means you have to have your scale out in your compost pile so you can weigh everything. Gardeners don't do that. And the browns and greens are just kind of an approximation, right? Right. So this this whole idea of getting this, the ratio, getting the ratios right, getting the ratio correct is important for fast compost, but it's not something the gardener can really do easily. Right. So um, the book has a couple of other alternatives to that. One is a simple way of just kind of putting things in piles. And I've done all those calculations for you and figured out what your approximate moisture level is and how do we convert weight to volume. And it actually allows you to do it by volume. Oh, that's very helpful. Another way you can do it is simply start piling stuff up and look at it. Okay, if you make a big pile and nothing happens, there's no heat, um, you don't have enough greens. You need more nitrogen in there, right? So you can add some greens or you can add some uh, nitrogen fertilizer. It works just as well. On the other hand, if you pile this up and a couple of days later, it's nice and hot, but it, it really smells like ammonia. It smells like urine. You've got way too much nitrogen. You've got to throw in some more brown stuff. Right. Like a pile of grass clippings will get like kind of a, like that. That's right. There's too much nitrogen in there. And so uh, they start smelling and yeah. they get slimy and wet and, and so on. Whereas if you mix that pile with brown leaves, that doesn't happen, right? Yeah, that's right. So one one way to start out this process is just, just pile something up and see what happens and then adjust it. And then once you've done this for a couple of years, you'll, you'll get a feel for how much of each you need. Mm-hmm. And the bottom line is it's not that critical. The stuff even composts in the back of your car, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. um, so it's just, it will just be a little slower if you don't get the ratio right. Yes. Um, we, we, I think before we started the program, we talked about, uh, you know, this composting just by piling stuff up. You can go and get your leaves, make a pile, completely wrong ratio and leave it. Okay, now it'd take a couple of years in a cold climate, but eventually it's compost. Right? Yes. So you can ignore all of that completely if, if you want to, or you can put a little more effort into it and make faster compost. Entirely up to you, which you, how much effort you want to put into this. But the idea of browns and greens is just a very, very rough approximation. So. Um, oh, the other one I see a lot is, you know, what what are you what can you compost and what shouldn't you compost? And um, well, let's let's look at reality. You can put anything you want in a compost pile, it will compost. Mm-hmm. Okay. 
uh, a dead rat, you know, a rabbit, a dog, whatever you want, you can put it in aerial compost, right? Um, some things are very, very slow to compost. So bones take forever. So you can kind of leave those out or throw them in with the meat and, and compost them. Um, some things you may not want to put in the compost pile for specific reasons. So uh, meat, for instance, a lot of people won't put in their compost pile because they don't want to attract rodents, right? Um, well, I got news for you. There's rodents in the garden anyways. Um, so I'm not sure that's such a big deal, but I understand people don't want rats in their backyard, right? Yeah. Uh, so you might leave the meat out. Uh, another thing that doesn't decompose, and most people think it does, is eggshells. Yes, uh, you've done a whole thing on that. And uh, for but, those that, is that a video or is that just a blog article? Uh, it's it's both. It's Robert's both. got this thing <laughs> where he's got an eggshell he buries. And he got, I mean, I'm going to, I'm not going to say it properly, but basically as it takes an eggshell, did you take the yolk out? Is it just a, yeah, an just a shell? Take yeah. the yogurt, he buries the thing, he digs it up every year to see if it's still there. Well, <laughs> it's I, still there. <laughs> I actually buried the, a bunch of them, and then every uh, year I, I dig one of them up to see how well yeah. much it's compost, and, and it doesn't. Like it, it will last 100 years. So eggshell, I mean, there's nothing wrong with throwing them in the compost pile. They're, they're not going to do any harm, but they're not going to compost. Well, and I think your impetus for this was the notion that uh, and this is the worst, and I don't want to get you off on it. So I don't want to distract you, but it's just so funny. The idea that your tomato plant has blossom end rot, so you stick an egg underneath your tomato mm -hmm. when you're planting it, and it's mm -hmm. going to put all this calcium yeah. into the soil. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and clearly not if the eggshell is still there years after, you know, I mean, it's very possible the egg might uh, increase the nitrogen content in the soil, I guess. Uh, you know, because you know, if you put a, a full and raw egg in, you know, like um, assuming it breaks at some point, but but mm -hmm. uh, anyway, sorry to spread this. It's okay. Um, the other thing that uh, some people don't put in is fats uh, because they will they will compost, but they're slow, um, and so they just hang around. So a little bit of fat, oil is okay. You probably don't want to put huge amounts in because I put the bacon fat in. Down. Like the, yeah. old, the, the pan, I just take the pan. Sometimes I save the fat for like something sinfully delicious later on. Uh, you want to waste that good, but often I'll just throw it in there. And, you know, yeah. I was visiting a friend of mine once and it was at her father's house. He was an Italian man from Italy. And he had like these like two foot high spinach. It was the mm. most amazing spinach I've ever seen. And I said, how do you do this? Right. And he was adamant <laughs> that spinach loves oil. That all is used cooking oil. He puts it in the ground. And as far as I know, it's just a carbon source, really oil. Um, but he said the, the used cooking oil, he puts it with his spinach. And I mean, that was, I mean, sometimes he's, you know, I don't know if it was just a coincidence, right? Yeah. But I mean, this is a guy who's like in his sixties and he's been doing it for years and he was, I mean, adamant that, oh, the spinach, it loves the oil, you know, have you ever heard of anything like that before? Uh, no. And I kind of doubt it because it's <laughs> not much in oil. Other than I think he just had good soil, you know, like he just had great spinach. I think it was a good variety of spinach and he had just good soil all around and, you know, yeah. it was growing well despite the oil. Um, yeah. Oils and fats will just decompose. They're organic matter, uh, but there aren't a lot of microbes that can digest the oils and fats. So most of them just leave it alone. But eventually, some enzyme they'll release some enzymes that will digest it, and and uh, eventually it gets used up. Um, uh, citrus is another one that comes up a lot. Don't put citrus in your compost pile. And uh, it's kind of interesting. Citrus actually has uh, antimicrobial properties. So it actually kills microbes. Uh, and that's why it sits around for a while. So citrus rinds, orange peels, lemon peels, so on. They do take a while to decompose, but eventually they'll decompose. There's nothing wrong with you putting those in there. Uh, pest waste is another one that, you know, a lot of people won't put into their compost pile. And I, I can see why you wouldn't go around the neighborhood and pick up, 
you know, dog poop from all your neighbors dogs but if it's your own pets uh, you're already exposed to it anyway so you might as well put it in a compost pile um it's actually good there's nothing wrong with it unless the pet the, the dog or cat has some sort of a disease right right and you don't know if if the little cat down the street maybe has a worms or whatever they get and that gets transferred into your pile you might not want that but most of those discussions are are come from governments who want to be super cautious about this. So they all say, don't put it in your compost. Pile. The reality is that the wild animals, the birds, the rats, the rabbits, they're all pooping all over the place anyways out there. Um, you know, my you old, uh, use it. my old house, I had kind of a man shed in the backyard. I really missed that man shed. I used to have the guys there and play poker and stuff. <laughs> Um, and I don't know how many guys pissed in my compost pile. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, probably everybody in the neighborhood. Uh, so. Well, your urine is actually a really good source of nitrogen. Uh, so. yeah. <laughs> I should, yeah. Including myself. I did it too. It just seemed like the right place to do it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so as far as what you can compost, the, the short answer is you can compost everything. Some things take longer and you might not want them in your compost. Some things might attract pests. You might not want them in your compost. But for the most part, you might as well put it in the compost. If it attracts some flies, well, they're going to go to the compost pile anyways. Uh, rats, they're going to go to the compost pile, so on. So I think we can be a lot less fussy about what we throw out there. Um Oh, this is a big one too, is should you put diseased plant material into your compost pile? Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah, they, they, uh, yeah the advice I usually see is not to do that. Correct. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. And most of that advice comes from government agencies, extension offices, and so on. And they're, they all say the same thing. Don't take diseased material and put it in your compost pile. Well, here's the problem we have. We generally make compost in the fall. That's when we have most of our material. Everything in the garden in the fall is diseased. Okay. You <laughs> cannot, it's all spent, you know. You cannot find a leaf in the in the garden that doesn't have a disease. It doesn't have fungal spores all over it. It has pathogens all over it. It doesn't matter what you're talking about if, if you're not going to put anything that's diseased in your compost pile you can't make compost <laughs> right it's simple as that um now there may be certain diseases that you might want to keep out of there but most fungal diseases those fungal by the time you see the spores and the spots on the leaves uh, they're everywhere. They're on the ground. They're on the branches. They're on the plant next to it. They're they're everywhere. It's it's and just waiting for if, the right conditions. Next yes, year. it's not as if they sit in that one spot, right? Yes, they're everywhere. So uh, if you think that you can clean up under one bush because it it got a certain disease and not use that, that's not going to happen, right? Mm. So my approach is just use it all. Now there are probably a couple really bad fungal diseases that if you get them you might want to get rid of that but for the most part um it's not going to make much of a difference mm. um you know maple trees have these tar spots on them yes and i see the advice all the time don't put those in your compost pile bag them up and give them to the city right well you're going to have black spots on on those maples every year for the rest of your life no matter what you do with the leaves, if you take them away, you leave them. I mean, everybody with maple trees in the whole town would have to get their property spotless. Yes. And then maybe you'll reduce the population a little bit, right? That's not going to happen. So you might as well use those leaves. So for the most part, I don't worry about diseases. Um, everything gets composted. Um, that makes sense. Uh, number four on my list is is finished compost. Okay. So we have yes. this term we call finished compost. And what does that actually mean? One of the most interesting things I found was that there's actually no scientific definition for finished compost. Really? 
there is no laboratory procedure to measure compost that says, okay, once you reach a uh, number 10, you're finished. Okay. I see, I see. There's no agreed method. Now there are methods for measuring compost to see how far along it is. Right. But there are different methods and they produce different results. And there's no agreed upon correct method to determine finished compost. That's uh you think you can we can measure how spicy a pepper is. You know, this was that the Schofield thing, which yeah. it doesn't matter. Like, who cares about that? But you know, something like compost, it should be, it should be, I don't know, like a weight or, you know, a, I guess you'd look at it under a microscope and see the size of the particles mm -hmm. or something like that. Well, one of the common methods is that you, you take this compost and you incubate it and you see how much CO2 it's producing. Uh, right? If it's still very active, then it produces more CO2 than one that's less active. Right. right. That makes sense. Um, but some people say, well, that only works with certain types of materials and only with certain combinations of material. And if you change the input materials, then it doesn't work so well and you get different readings. Um, bottom line is that there is no measurement for finished compost. Okay. So you and I, we decide it's finished uh, either when we don't have any more patience to make it go any farther. Um, or a common description is that once the pile cools down, then it's finished. Um, when we look at it, it we can't see the we can't see most of the original material, right? We'll still see orange rinds and corn cobs and eggshells, eggshells, and some of these things because they're slow to decompose. Pieces of wood will still be there, but for the most part, the soft, leafy stuff has turned into black stuff. Yeah. But our eyes are so poor at determining how it's decomposed that you know, if as long as it's black, we call it finished. Uh, the good news is that it's really not that important as a gardener. So once we get to a point where it's no longer heating up, uh, we can probably put it into our garden. Now, a lot of people will let it sit and age. And I'm not sure quite what that means, except that it makes people feel good. So they leave it for <laughs> two or three months to age and then, then they use it. They're waiting for it to look like coffee grinds like yeah. that. Perfect black. Perfect black, black. Yeah. Now there, there is some science here that does make sense. So if we take material that is very high in carbon and low in nitrogen, and we put that into our soil, it does tend to rob nitrogen away from our plants. Right? So that's one of the reasons why you never want to take wood chips and bury them in, into your soil because they will actually reduce the nitrogen level in your soil, which means that plants have trouble getting nitrogen. The same is true with compost. If it's too fresh, the carbon level is still high relative to nitrogen. And it, if we put that in soil, it will actually um, take nitrogen away from our plant. So we'll harm them that way. And the heat may also harm plant roots. So there is a point where it's it's better material. So if, if you want to use it right away, what I would suggest doing is just mulch with it. Keep it on top of the soil. Mm. That will not rob the soil of nitrogen and the heat isn't an issue, right? If you want to be on the safe side, you let it sit a little longer. Now, if you're digging it into a garden bed, it probably really doesn't matter because you're not going to be adding that much mm. material. On the other hand, some people use the compost in pots and then they plant you know, seeds right into the compost. Some people use 100% compost. If you're doing that, you do have to be more careful and you have to wait till it's aged a little more. Mm. And the best thing then is, is to run a little experiment. And in fact, this is, this is a valid test for finished compost, one of them. And that is you take your compost and you plant some seeds in it, bean seeds, pea seeds, something that germinates easily. And you see how they do. If they germinate and grow normally, normal sized leaves and so on, mm -hmm. the compost is finished enough to use. On the other hand, if it's too fresh, you'll get seedlings that are crippled. So they see. won't grow straight or the leaves will be kind of crippled and crunched and so on. And you'll, you'll see right away that the seedlings aren't doing well or they might not germinate at all. Mm. So uh, a test that gardeners can use is simply 
get a pot, put some compost in it, put some seeds in it. And ideally beside that, do one with soil, right? So yeah, you control, yeah. control you know, yeah. two pots, one with soil, one with your, your compost, but put five seeds in each one and see what happens. If they sort of germinate the same and look the same and they both look ha healthy, then the compost is ready to use. Mm. Right, right. That makes sense. Um, the, the fifth one, uh, yeah, this was uh, on the list of things people get wrong, uh, is probably moisture. moisture. Moisture is one of the hardest things to control in this pile. If it's too dry, the microbes can't live properly. One of the things I never really appreciated until I, I wrote the, the micro book was that um, bacteria and fungi, but particularly bacteria, they don't live in soil. Mm -hmm. They live in water. Almost oh. all bacteria need to live in water. In the soil solution, right? So they're living in that thin film of water that surrounds the soil particles. Yes. Okay. They're actually in water. They're not in dry air. I see. It's a petri dish kind of thing. Or, yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Even if, if we're looking at microbes, for instance, growing on a leaf, you know, you might say, okay, the leaf's really dry. But in, in fact, it isn't. The microbes actually produce uh, a starchy type material and coat themselves in this film that holds moisture. Mm. And the leaves have holes and they're constantly giving up moisture. And this stuff actually captures that moisture and keeps the, oh. the bacteria wet. What's that? Term? It's hydrophilic. Yeah. Right? It's, yes. Okay. Yes. So microbes need to live in water. Right. The compost pile gets too dry, the microbes start dying off, composting stops. So you need a certain amount of moisture in there. On the other hand, if we had too much moisture, then the environment gets too wet for them and they don't get enough air. Mm. Microbes are fussy little guys. Yeah, so they yeah. want a certain amount of, of water and a certain amount of air. And if it's the pile is too wet, they don't get enough air. And again, they start dying off. Right. And it becomes anaerobic and the pile starts smelling. Now, that's another reason why your, your compost pile might get stinky is if you got it too wet. Mm. Um, yeah. And it does. it is a bit of a trick. I mean, it's not that critical. Like you don't have to be within a percent or two of moisture, but there are those extremes you want to watch. So if it hasn't rained for a couple of weeks, you should be watering your compost pile. Mm you're in rainy season you might want to cover your compost pile to keep it drier mm. all right, all right. so moisture is more critical than most people think right yeah um, man so that's my list that's your list well that's all that's all great stuff and if you want more information than that buy this book <laughs> uh where, where do people go to buy your book robert uh, the easiest place is on Amazon. Amazon. And the other place is directly from my publisher, which is New Society Publishing. New Society Publishing. Yeah. All right. And they've got, and you've, like you said, you got another book, Microbe Science. Microbe Science is out. And uh, it's the first half of the book talks all about microbes, how they live, how they interact. And then the second, probably two thirds of the book is, is how the microbes actually interact with each other and how they interact with plants. I see. Um, and there's some really interesting stuff on there. We'll have to maybe do it a different podcast. But yeah, no, just as sure. a teaser, like, did you know that plants actually allow certain bacteria to enter their seeds so that those bacteria are passed along to their progeny? Really? Okay, so when a seed germinates, it actually starts out with bacteria from the mother plant. Just like us. Just like We've us. We've got bacteria in our, what is that, biome or whatever that term is. Yeah, uh, ah. just like humans. When babies are born, human babies are born, they, they get covered in bacteria and stuff, and they uh, have it inside their cells and in their bloodstream, and plants are doing a similar thing. Huh, that's right? fascinating. Yeah. Okay. So there's a lot of really interesting stuff about how how these things interact and who's controlling who and the fact that all these microbes are fighting against each other. You know, we talk about all these 
beneficial microbes, these nice microbes, but no, microbes aren't nice. They're constantly fighting each other. They're either using chemical warfare. They're, the larger ones are gobbling up the smaller ones. Um, so they're constantly fighting. And that, that fighting, it turns out, is critical for plant growth. Okay, plants, plants grow best with nematode poop. Right, yes, yes. And nematodes eat bacteria and, and whatever else is floating around. So, right. Uh, and then, and that gets back to this ratio of carbon to nitrogen, which turns out to be critical with microbes. Um, and the way the microbes live and the way they fight each other changes the ratio in the soil to benefit the plants. Oh, my God. That, that makes sense, right? Because you've got this this changeover, right? This I, I remember reading some book written by like an ancient Rome about a battle mm. that was fought over a field and the battle was so bloody that it was a particularly good harvest the next year. <laughs> yeah, I bet it was. <laughs> well, 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 blood is a great source of yeah. nitrogen. The author had mentioned it was like a particularly good uh, fertile <laughs> harvest from all of the uh, the carnage. But it would be the same thing in your soil. You've just got everything's, it's like a war of all against all. And, 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 you know, yeah, some portion of that population is uh, going into another portion of the population and coming back out of it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. sort of thing. So, and all that's becoming a kind of manure. We were doing a talk uh, once and I was talking about thinking about manure in a different way. Like that we think about manure is like it comes out of a cow or comes out of sheep. And the way I was thinking of it was like, if you keep a garden mulched, all of that mulch is going to go in something and come out of something. Yeah. Some microorganism or even it's, a worm or whatever, something, right? It's all going to become manure. It's, it's all, it's all, micro, it's all <laughs> micro poop. Yes, exactly. So it's all manure, right? It's just it's thinking sure. about manure in a different way. You don't have to um, necessarily get truckloads of manure. Um, if you've got enough organic matter uh, on top of your soil or in your soil, it's going to become a manure of, of some kind eventually, um, because that's what's going well, on. Well, think about this uh, in relation to composting. So um, what is manure? Well, it's it's partially digested organic matter. Right? Was, a lot yeah. of it's, it's plant material, but if it's coming from humans, there's also some meat in there. But it's partially digested um, organic matter plus a huge amount of microbes. Yes, right. We're 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 our bodies are are growing microbes in our gut, and a lot of those microbes come out the other end along with the undigested organic matter. Yes. Well, we're basically a composting machine. Like a worm. You know? We're just, we're very much like a worm. In fact. Yes. Yeah. Um, we're, we, we don't produce finished compost. <laughs> we produce a really hot compost, but <laughs> we, we are basically, animals are basically composters. Yes. Right. We, we take organic matter, we put it in, we, we chop it up. We add a whole bunch of microbes. Our microbes start working on it. Uh, all kinds of chemical reactions take place. All the enzymes are digesting things, and we get some nutrients out, and and actually most of them just pass on through for the the next generation. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> that makes perfect sense. <laughs> all right, this is great, and I think we actually did do an entire episode. I don't think I'm going to need to edit this at all. I think we worked out for, of course, you know, we haven't finished it yet, but um, no, this is great. Uh, thanks for coming and talking about your book. I'm just talking about composting in general and uh, we'll have to have you on again, maybe to talk about composting a little bit more, but uh, certainly to talk about your next book. Uh, don't, don't send me the next book. I have to finish reading this. <laughs> I don't feel like it's like the way I, with my kids, like you can't get your new toy until you're done playing with the old toy. So mm -hmm. uh, I gotta, I'll, I'll email you when I'm done reading this. Well, I, thought I, you I, had, should... I thought you'd What's gotten that? the new, I thought you'd gotten the micro board. You I don't just... have that one yet. No, no I don't have that anywhere here. Okay. Yeah, I do. And I still got to finish reading this one. I got to get through it. I mean, the book, these books aren't hard to read. Like, you know, really. 
um, if you really just sat down and as, as I've explained, I tend to read these on the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> I, wasn't I got into them. one of my kids read a book this summer. And for those of you that have like the teenagers or young, young kids, uh, it was recommended to me. My son doesn't like reading so much like chapter books as much as he likes reading comic books. And it's a book called Hatchet. And it's about a boy who uh, is in a plane crash and he has to survive in the woods and all he has is a hatchet. And uh, he read it. I mean, it's like, I can't get him to read a book, right? He read it. And then, so I said, I'm going to read that thing. So instead of reading this, I was reading that. <laughs> and, but I read the whole thing on the toilet, you know, like, uh, you know, one, you know, like half a chapter a day sort of thing. But it was really, really, even me, I found it like a great story to read. And then my daughter read it. She's, uh, she's 13 now, but she was 12. She read it in one day. Right, wow. about the size of this. <laughs> read it in one day. Right, um, so highly recommend that if you've got uh, young people in the house and they don't necessarily. It's one of those books you just you can't. You got to figure out what happens to this kid. Is he gonna? What's he gonna do about that? Every day that something bad happens and he's gonna figure <laughs> out some way to get by. Um, anyway, it's it's that book's fault. <laughs> I didn't finish reading this one. <laughs> so um, anyway, I'll finish this up soon. All right, great. This was great. Great having you on again, as always, Robert. Can't wait to have you on next time. Can't wait to read that new new, uh, new book. All so right. everybody out there, hope you found this interesting. If you did, please like, share, subscribe. <laughs> Until next time, get out there, get at it, have fun in your garden. Robert, thank you so much for coming on the podcast again. Thanks for being here. Or thanks for having me. It's great. great. Always, always good to be on your show. <laughs> great. Hey, if you want to help support everything I'm doing here, go to Vessies.com to buy whatever you need for your garden this year. And use my coupon code GAVS23 to get free shipping as long as there's a pack of seeds in the order and there's no oversized items in the order. Check out the description box of this video for details. You can buy everything you need from Vessies. They have seeds, fruit bushes and trees, soil amendments, pest solutions, tools, clothing and lots of other stuff too. So yeah, if you want to help support everything I'm doing here and they sell something you need, buy from them using my coupon code and happy gardening.